Welcome. We're going to get started. So welcome to AU. Welcome to American University. Both those of you that are here in person and the faculty that we have here online. So excited to um, welcome you to our community. So to get started, I'm Monica Jackson. I'm Deputy Provost and Dean of Faculty here. And I think look around the room. I got to meet many of you during your hiring process. And so I'm looking forward to getting to know the rest of you that I didn't, didn't get a chance to meet throughout this academic year. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been at AU for a long time, about 18 years now. I've been faculty in the math and stat department most of that time. And then I joined the administration about five years ago, um, first as an associate dean and now as deputy provost and dean of faculty. But I am still very much heavily embedded in faculty life. I still teach, I still do research, I have grants, I do service. So I still feel very, feel very connected with the faculty that we have here at AU. Um, but I want to let you know, you all are joining a very vibrant community here. We have about 15 full-time faculty, well, 15, 1,500 full-time and part, I know 15 or more 15 room, <laughs> 1,500 full-time and part-time faculty on our campus. And that's spread across the different schools and colleges here. We, and that includes a, about approximately 100 new faculty that are full-time, part-time that are joining us the, for the first time this academic year. And so again, you all get to meet them throughout the year. Um, as your Dean of Faculty, I will be working with you on a number of things. So for one, I will help you. If you need to find research collaborators, you can reach out to me, I'll help you with that. If you're looking for new innovative ways to teach, I'll connect you with CTRL to help with that as well. And I'll be calling on many of you to help with our many service projects across the, the university. And for some of you, if you're interested in pathways to leadership, I'll be happy to talk to you about that as well. So you'll have many, many opportunities to get involved with our community here. Uh, one thing you're going to learn quickly about AU is the strength of our community. We have a very tight-knit community, and you see our students are just now, the first-year students are moving in this week. And you're going to love working with them inside and outside the classroom. And you're going to hear a lot about them during your um, orientation these next two days. Um, you're also going to hear about our inclusive excellence plan. We have a very strong inclusive excellence plan, which is the core of American University. And it's aimed at fostering a supportive and inclusive environment for all on our campus. In all of your schools and colleges, you have DEI officers that are going to assist you with our university goals. But something you may not know is that AU is recipient of a $1 million NSF advance grant. And it's aimed at closing the gap between our faculty. So that's gender inequities, racial inequities, the term and tenure lines. So again, just to provide a better experience for everyone here at AU. So while you're here these next two days, you're gonna find many resources here. So you're, this event right now is being sponsored by the Center for Teaching, Research and Learning. You're gonna interact with them quite a bit. But also our Office of Research Innovation, which is led by Diana Burley. You're gonna meet her a little bit later on to help you with um, applying for grants and different things. And, but many offices across the campus are going to be speaking to you about their opportunities. But to start, as I mentioned, we are a tight-knit community and to get ready with our community building. I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about each of the schools and colleges that you're joining. And when I do that, if you all can just raise your hand so your colleagues can get to know you, and that's for you all online as well, if you can do the same. And we could do this in person pre-COVID with everyone, but with hybrid, I know it's a little bit difficult, but I want to see if I connect as many of you as possible. So to start, let's start with the College of Arts and Sciences, CAS. That is my home unit. Anyone here from CAS? That's our largest. We show quite a few here from College of Arts and Sciences, including online. That's our largest unit. About half of our faculty are in the College of Arts and Sciences, and we have 20 departments, over 150 majors, um, certificates, minors, and graduate programs. And that's our arts, humanities, sciences, and social sciences. What about the School of International Services, SIS? Anyone in the room or online? Quite a few there. We have about 120 full-time faculty in, this, in, this, in the School of International Service, about 20 programs. And this year is an exciting year for them. They newly formed departments this year. And so they will be unrolling that out for, for the campus community this year. What about COGOT? That's our School of Business. But quite a few co faculty that are here. 
They have degree programs in business administration, finance, econ, name a few, and they're top rankings for many of their programs. And a little known fact, they are one of the oldest accredited business programs in this area. Uh, Washington College of Law. For anyone on, online in Washington College, we have, we have about four new faculty from Washington College of Law that are joined. We have one or two on my three. Their specialty <laughs> programs are constantly ranked in the top tier in the U.S. News and World Report, especially their clinical and international law programs. And they are located just off the main campus near Tinley Metro Center, if you haven't um, seen their location. What about this uh, SBA, School of Public Affairs? Yes, our, our, our <laughs> provost. <laughs> Um, they are ranked you know, in, in the top 10, right, Vicki? Top, yeah. top 10, <laughs> you know. So very, very, we're very proud of that ranking. And they have over 1,600 students in these programs, and they have degree programs in justice and law, data science, and political science, to name a few. School of Communications. We have a couple there, including we have a new dean um, here as far as the School of Communications as well. I'm sorry. No, oh, I'm sorry. That's what we have said. Not school. We have a, I don't know, it was... Was our new team? Yeah, she probably wouldn't be part of this. Yeah, there. Um, but their programs include game design, communications, and media arts, to name a few. And they have quite a few notable alum and faculty. For one, Russell um, Williams, who just retired recently, he went to Oscars for his work in Glory and Dances with Wolves. And Juliana Rancic is also an uh, alumni of the School of Communications. What about our library faculty? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, small but mighty, our library. They have about 20 faculty there. And they are the center hub for our campus. So they're right next to the big clock that's on the main campus. And so our students connect there. They have many resources for the faculty. So you definitely want to speak to them to see how they can support you in your research and teaching needs here. Uh, uh, School of Education, SOE. Yeah, we have a few there. Very good. I've been all of you. So we have graduate and graduate programs there, elementary ed, special ed, and education policy leadership and leadership and policy name a few. And they have um, they have an exciting program where they've been partnering with the urban teachers program. So they have quite a few probably faculty that are on, they're not actually here. They're in Texas, I believe, for the most part, that are partnering with us. And so you won't ever see them on campus, but they'll be connecting with us uh, virtually. And they have a new acting coaching that's joining us this year as well. Okay, so I think I've helped everyone. So that's just a little bit about AU. And again, you'll be meeting with myself and our provost throughout the years. So we connect a little bit better. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, which is our acting provost, the chief academic officer, uh, Vicki Wilkins. So Vicki is has a PhD in public science from the University of Missouri. But before her current position, she was the dean of the School of Public, uh, public Administration. School of Public Affairs for five years. So she's very instrumental in leading that new rankings they have in the top 10. Um, before that, she served as associate dean for four years in the, in the same school. She's, she's a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and is a very distinguished scholar. So please join me welcoming your provost, Vicki Wilkins. Thank you, Monica, and thank you for your organization of this event and for the help of CTRL and everyone that's making today happen for all of you. I'm excited to be here to greet you and appreciate that introduction. I am also a professor in the Department of Public Administration and Policy, and I, like Monica, have not given up my faculty hat. Somebody recently said to me, put on your academic hat, and I said, that's the only hat I have. So I don't know what uh, they were thinking, but I, I truly am glad to be here and think of my role as number one cheerleader, supporter, helper, uh, community builder for all of you. I think our faculty are part of what makes this university so amazing. And you combine that with our outstanding students and what you have here is a really special community. So welcome to that. I know that it's a time of choice and people are making lots of choices about academia and where they go. And I just wanna thank you for choosing to join us. I. Uh, we're very humbled and grateful to have you with us today and look forward to watching you contribute to the lives of our students and to our community overall in the time to come. I want to hit on a few things uh, about where we are planning wise at the university, what's been going on here. I'm not sure if your time of looking at the university involved a review of our strategic plan. 
maybe, maybe not. Uh, but I just want to hit on a few things. We are in an accelerator phase of that plan. We've been working it for the last five years. We know that COVID created a change in us. We did not let COVID fly by us. We grabbed the things that we learned to do really well during COVID and that really made us better. And we're pulling those with us um, because we think that's the best thing to do into this accelerator phase. And so, you know, we're focused here on research, uh, community and students and learning. And we also have our imperatives around things that are gonna be very important to you, including how we work as a university, uh, how faculty teach and teaching and learning and education around inclusive excellence, as Monica said, is a core to what we do um, around issues of research and research funding. We have a great team here to help you if you think that is something you want to pursue, try it out. We have a community of people who receive external funding. We are scholar teachers, and that means something here. Uh, a lot of places might claim that tag or have it somewhere on their website. For us, it's the very identity of our faculty. They take very ser seriously that role of being both a scholar, but bringing that into the classroom and sharing it with our outstanding students. They also find great opportunities to work and research uh, and be part of our students. And we also are committed to being part of the DC community. We're set up here in the Northwest. We're very unique in that we have this beautiful campus in this pristine setting, National Arboretum. We all get to enjoy it, but that doesn't release us from our responsibility to being a part of the DC community and making sure that we're not watching from a distance, but that we're involved in the lives of those of us, all of us who live in DC, uh, all parts of DC and making it a better place for us. Um, I also wanna hit on the fact that, as I said, we have excellence in our faculty. You see that not only in the outstanding teaching, uh, but in the research. Last year, we hit an amazing goal of $51 million in uh, research external funding, which is a great thing. And we also, though, are committed to not only research that brings funding into us, but research that goes out and has impact. And that can include the impact in having non-academic audiences read your work and understand it and bringing uh, that conversation to them, but also in how we can impact policy and where we can be part of those conversations in those rooms where people are meeting and making decisions um, that need our research, need our scholarship to drive them forward. So that is a very important part to us. Um, I hope as a member of the faculty here, you will choose to get involved in our shared governance plan, our faculty senate. Um, you know many of the folks on faculty senate, very close member, uh, friend with the chair. Uh, it's a great place to get involved. They need you uh, and you will enjoy them. So please look out for opportunities to get involved with our faculty uh, senate. I also want to let you know about some new things that you'll see having Monica and I doing work this year. Uh, first, we have some new leaders on campus. Uh, two are in the room. We have uh, co-acting deans in the School of Education. We have Rodney Hobson, who is brand new to us here as one of those co-acting deans, along with uh, Cor Corbin Campbell. And then we have Bridget Trajan, who is with us, who is our dean of undergraduate, it's a long title, undergraduate education and services. I'm good. I'm good. Yes. Um, but we have interim deans also in the School of Communication and in the School of Public Affairs. And I have to tell you, they are both longstanding members of this community. They bleed uh, uh, blue and red for sure. And so you'll want to make sure to be involved with them, along with the entire amazing leadership team. If you're coming in to us as a term faculty member, it's an exciting year as we implement our new category of continuing appointment. This has been a process of uh, faculty involvement in pro over the last year, maybe 18 months, and Monica has led this am amazing effort to bring us to this place where we're implementing continuing appointments. Um, we're still making sure we let people know about the opportunities for experiential education here, what we're doing there, lifelong learning as a focus, student thriving, not only is it part of our planning and what we do every day and how we think about it, we are building a huge student thriving center on campus. It's one of the few capital projects we have going on in this uh, campaign, and it's going to be Mary Graydon and kind of back. If you don't know that yet, you will soon. Um, and really a place of wellness 
campus and a place for our students to enjoy on so many levels their college experience. So lots of great things going on. You're going to have chances to meet with Monica and I over the next year. I hope you'll take advantage of them. I do look forward to getting to know you. Last week, we sent out a pre-fall message. It's one of the longer emails you ever get, and I'm sorry about that, but it is five meetings in one email, so that's good. Uh, but there's a great email, lots and lots of great information in there. Please look for it. It came out under my name, and it will get you ready for entering the classroom in the fall and what's going on, let you know about a lot of great resources. And then I want to invite you personally to the fa fall faculty welcome. It's going to be back in this room on September 5th at 3.30 to 5. It's a great time on campus. We'll have a slideshow of all of you. You'll want to be here, meet the faculty, come together. It's a really nice way to kick off the fall and get things started. So as if we timed it perfectly, <laughs> I now get to introduce someone very important to you, uh, and that is our 15th president and first woman president to serve American University, Sylvia Burwell. I also have to say a great partner of mine and someone I always look forward to working with. She's an experienced leader who has spent the past six years helping AU excel as a, a leading student-centered research university. Prior to joining AU, you may already know, President Burwell had held two cabinet positions in the U.S. government, serving as Secretary of Health and Human Services and Director of uh, the Office of Management and Budget. She also held leadership positions in two of the largest foundations in the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Walmart Foundation. Again, she's a great partner to our work and to the work of our faculty and everyone on campus. I'm so happy to be able to introduce you to her this morning. So please join me in welcoming President Sylvia Burwell. Thanks so much, Vicki. Vicki, thank you for your introduction and also thank you for your leadership. Uh, you've not only led SBA to the top 10 in the nation again and again, which actually I just told those were two parents out there touring with their daughters, and I did mention that. And of course, SIS, because um, we're in, in the building. Um, you also are now leading our academic work with vision and vigor uh, in terms of that. So, so glad. And Monica, also want to thank you. Um, for your leadership in your role with our faculty, as well as your role with inclusive excellence, including your efforts to increase equity in our faculty as part of the AU Advance Grant from NSF. Um, your impact is felt in so many ways and want to recognize that and make sure our new faculty know, uh, they'll know you in one form, but also in terms of your academic work and the work on uh, our inclusive excellence. I want to thank Anna and our whole CTRL team for putting this together. Thank you. I was just saying, I'm so happy we're in rounds. It's so much better than like the rows. So um, thank you for that. And to all of you all for joining us, uh, joining us today in orientation. For those of you online, hello. I'm not sure where the cameras are. There's the camera. Um, uh, welcome. And for those of you in the room, we're so glad uh, that you're here today for orientation. And we're so glad to welcome you to American University because you're coming to us at an exciting time. And while it is a time of transition, I'm sure some of you may have heard, this is my last academic year. I have said, and you probably have read this or seen this, that I believe this will be our best year um, yet. And I'm really looking forward to working with you all to accelerate our momentum and the momentum that this university has. And as I was thinking about this, um, as an example of that momentum, I actually wanted to share breaking news because what I thought was better than me telling you uh, about who we are, actually give you an example um, of who you are. And actually, when I go back to my office, I am going to hit the button on an announcement to the entire community. And it's an announcement that is about all the concepts that I was going to talk about here in terms of who we are. One is community, which is why I like the rounds. That's just everything about community. Inclusive excellence, the importance of scholarship, the importance of teaching and mentoring, and the importance of change making. And these are all things that I'm looking forward to you all being engaged in, involved. I'm going to be sending out an email and I want to tell you what it is. It's about the creation of the Abdul Aziz Saeed Chair in International Peace, 
and Conflict Resolution. And it's an endowed chair that's named in memory of one of AU's most cherished scholar teachers. And it's made possible through the philanthropic support of our dedicated community. So Professor Saeed was not only a triple eagle, three-time alumnus. He was also a member of the School of International Service, the building that we're now in. He was part of their faculty for almost 60 years. He joined SIS when it first opened in 1957. And he helped to shape SIS's signature charge of waging peace, which is what President Eisenhower said when he dedicated it. So you have a general who's a president who helps dedicate this school, and he says it's going to wage peace. And, and Said was very involved in that. And his impact resonates well beyond AU, as he was a pioneer in the field of international affairs. So think about the 50s and think about the concept of waging peace. And he served in the State Department. He helped the United Nations, he worked with UNESCO, and he engaged in conflict resolution projects on topics that ranged from urban schools to the Israel-Palestinian peace talks. There are pictures, and I think outside his office, there may even be the picture where his office was of him with President Carter as he was um, talking about those peace talks. And back in the 1950s, when Jewish students were excluded from the already established organizations on our campus, Professor Said stepped in and he created Phi Epsilon Pi fraternity. And he served as its faculty and advisor for many, many years. And so now it's the Phi Up brothers who are part of this philanthropic effort to continue Professor Said's legacy uh, in creating the Said chair. And that full circle, that commitment to the core values of inclusivity and community is a great example of the change making that is at the core of this university. And in keeping with that change making tradition, we'll name Professor Mohammed Abu Nimr, who will serve as the inaugural Saeed Chair. And Professor Abu Nimr is a professor here at SIS in International Peace and Conflict Resolution, our program here. And it was first founded by Professor Saeed. And he has 33, 35 years of experience in teaching here at AU. 22 of those years he spent alongside Professor Saeed. So Professor Abu Nimr has led interreligious conflict resolution training interfaith dialogue workshops in conflict areas around the world. He's developed numerous courses that deal with peace building and conflict resolution. And he, like Professor Saeed, is a pioneer. And we're looking forward to the important work of this chair. And I thought this was just a great example instead of me. This is an example I think you'll remember in terms of the um, concepts that we're talking about. And it's just one example of the exciting things that are happening on campus. Uh, and we're going to be making more announcements actually in the coming weeks that are related to these faculty type things and our support for our faculty. And it's all part of our Change Makers for a Changing World um, campaign, which is a $500 million campaign. We're in our last year. Uh, and faculty and faculty support has been a important part of that. We're in the last 70 million. Uh, I like to call it our jet fuel for our ambitions and our faculty are such an important part of that. Um, it's also gonna help us make our largest investment in student thriving. Um, that the university has known, a $109 million um, student thriving center that uh, works on everything from consolidating all our health issues um, to student engagement and gathering places. So um, this campaign, our exceptional leadership and many who are part of this orientation are why we've made so much progress so far and why we're going to. And I believe that our momentum is only going to accelerate. And you all are an incredibly important part of that. And we've made a lot of progress. We've doubled our externally funded research over the past three years in terms of that focus on the scholarship side of our work. Um, and that's thanks to Vice Pro Provost Diana Burley. I, I, is Diana coming today? No, I'm sure you all will meet her and hope that you do meet her. Um, we were the first university to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, she is coming. Oh, she's coming tomorrow. Tomorrow you will see Diana. Um, the, you will see Diana. Uh, 
we were first university to achieve carbon neutrality and we're working hard to get to zero waste by 2030. Our inclusive excellence work is another important part. Um, that's part of why I wanted to mention Monica's work um, at the beginning of it. And as Vicki said in her remarks, you know, this idea of engaging uh, in terms of that engagement with the university and whether that's through the faculty senate or others, these are all things that are about our momentum. The biggest reason though that I know um, that we're gonna have it is you all are emblematic of where we're going, of the potential and of our impact. New faculty members this year include Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Wesley Lowry, who will lead SOC's investigating reporting workshop, taking the reins from Chuck Lewis. Wesley has produced groundbreaking reporting and writing on race and justice. Or I'm just gonna give a few examples. I would love to go through everybody in the room. I love reading what you all do, but I'll just give a few. Kyle Hackett, is Kyle here? There you are, Kyle. Painter, whose work aims to construct ideas of identity through the subtext of staged and self-aware portrait. Kyle, welcome. Or Chelsea Wagner Koch. Chelsea, are you in the room? Are you online? If you're online, wave. Um, whose research using biomarkers and stable isotopes to better understand marine ecosystems in the Arctic and the consequences of climate change, boy, have we wanted to understand that more this summer, is also advancing ethical and anti-colonial approaches to science. And multiply that exponentially. If I was able to go through um, everyone and what you all are doing, uh, and you can't help but be bullish on the future of higher ed. And I'm one of the people that is. Um, and also your future of service. Uh, when I keep coming back to that because that's important. And it's important because community, it really is a concept that helps drive us. It's um, the community is where we are because of that concept of community and we will continue to move forward because of that. Um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. Um, Challenges like AI, affordability, um, how we all work through freedom of expression and divides um, that come to our campus and, and are on our campus. The challenges that were created by the recent Supreme Court decision, uh, which impacts our inclusive excellence work. And on that, while we will comply with the ruling, uh, we will not change our commitment to that core value that you've heard me talk about again and again. It's central to our mission, and we believe we can't truly be excellent without being inclusive uh, in its broadest sense. We want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for your energy and your passion uh, that you're going to bring to this campus and to the mission and work that we do together. I really look forward to all of us working together. And I think Vicki and Monica are now going to come up and we'll take some questions. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Hello, I'm just gonna make a quick announcement. I'm Anna Olsen from CTRL. So I will be facilitating the Q&A along with Lindsay. And so if you're in the room, if you could please raise your hand and wait for me to walk the mic over to you uh, and just introduce yourself with your name, your department, and maybe a short sentence about your academic field. Uh, and if you're online, you could do the same thing. You can raise your hand, Lindsay will keep an eye out and we'll call your name when it's your turn. So off we go. Any questions for our three panelists? Great. Stand. Uh, yeah. I'll stand. <laughs> uh, so my name is Susan Major. I actually grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia, home of WVU. Um, and um, part of what I've reflected on, you know, sadly lately is just the challenges that that university is going through. So I'm really curious, like what has AU done to really differentiate yourself because you've moved forward in growth and, and higher ed is definitely experiencing some challenges. So I'd just love to know what you think that part of that secret sauce is. Um, Thank you for that question and welcome. And so you know, on September 5th, our soccer team will be playing WVU at 4 p.m. We know who we're cheering for. Go AU. Even though I do have two honorary degrees from West Virginia University. Um, so this question, and you know, I, I want to give um, Gordon Gee, who is the president, current president of WU credit, because he's taking on the hard, hard decisions and the hard decisions. So I think in higher ed, and it's part of why I came to higher ed. Um, when I came to higher ed, I believed it was a time of tectonic shifts. 
Um, and I, I just believe that that is what it is. And when I talked about tectonic shifts, I really talked about um, four things. And I did this in my interview because I, I don't think I need to point out to you. I am from West Virginia. Maybe I need to point that out to you all. Um, but I don't need to point out to you everything that Vicki went over. I am what is generally referred to as a non-traditional uh, president. Um, I'm not sure that that will be, you know, what it's called forever, but that is what it's called now. So the, these four shifts that are happening, one is about learning and how students learn uh, and how they think about that and what learning is. And boy, oh boy, is that one going to get accelerated by AI uh, in terms of, of what we uh, do there. The second thing that was changing is work. And part of it I didn't get right at that time. Um, I knew that the students were going out and they might have many, many jobs and we didn't even know what our students would be doing and that sort of thing. The part I did not get right was the value proposition of work, which is actually important to us. It's important to you as a faculty member. And so focusing on that value proposition of work as well as changing work. The third thing were the economics of higher education. And those economics have been built and designed on a system and approach that historically worked, but now is challenged. Why do we think everyone's talking about affordability uh, in higher education? And for many of you all, I don't need to tell you uh, about that because either you've completed or some of you may even have children that are, you know, as you're thinking through um, how they do it. So the economics of higher ed, and that interacts with the demographics. And that's one of the things that's really, really hurt West Virginia uh, in terms of West Virginia University, State University, where funding has been dramatically cut and population declines and declines of numbers of students going to the university. Um, and then the fourth issue is what are the social and sometimes referred to as cultural issues that affect the nation and the world, but become uh, acute on a campus because we are a microcosm and we are generally the front end, whether that's mental health issues, whether that's divides that occur. So we kind of have focused on all four of those things. That was a part of how we came to a strategy. So those tectonic shifts have driven our strategy. Um, our strategy is change makers for a changing world. And our campaign is change can't wait the jet fuel just so you all kind of understand the lingo. But by connecting ourselves to what are these challenges, a strategy to address those challenges, and then great people to work against it, that is how I would answer your question. And I wouldn't uh, be critical of my colleague because right now my colleague um, has a number, as I said, of, of, of forces that are hard. And so choices have to be made. And you know what? I would also just say brave because you know what he did. He's making all those choices and he announced he'll leave um, year after next. So he created a situation where he makes the tough choices to get the institution stabilized, which you can, uh, one can argue on edges, but that's what was happening. But for us, what I would say is why we are. And uh, the Stern School, a professor at the Stern School, as we were getting ready in uh, New York, NYU, um, as we were going through COVID, um, put universities in buckets. And this is as COVID starting. And it was like, those that won't do well, those that'll like tread, and those that will accelerate. And we were in that accelerate category. Because much of what COVID did accelerated these problems, these four things. When you think about the four things I mentioned, they were accelerated by COVID, but we had a strong strategy in place. We kept going and community. Uh, you know, that's how we ran COVID, a community of care. Um, inclusive excellence, This we did all of that. We had an anti-racist research and policy center. We were the first in the nation. Um, and it was all before some of the issues that occurred in terms of our community. We did inclusive excellence because it's broad and flexible. Um, in terms of, and when I say broad and flexible, on this campus, when we started it, it was issues of black, white, but we knew inclusive excellence. You had to think about it all together. And we've been through different pieces and parts and we're able to flex and uh, evolve. So I hope that gives you a sense of why we are where we are. Sorry, didn't think I was gonna go through the whole strategy with you all today, but um, I hope that's helpful as you all enter into this community in terms of the things that are important and where we're going and what we're doing. Great question. Did you want to add anything, Vicki or Monica, from your all's perspective? 
I think that's good. I think you'll also appreciate the transparency we have here. What you just saw on display in Sylvia's answer is what you also see on display in the way we talk about our budget, our budgeting process, and the way we think through those things. So you'll know what we know. And I think that should be right now a big relief to folks watching West Virginia because I don't think they knew. Other questions? All right. I'll be right there. Thanks so much. Pleasure to meet you last Thursday with the team. And um, the West Virginia example is a really interesting one because uh, we noticed recently that uh, the uh, abolishment of war languages and literatures happened at WVU. And so this is a question maybe for our, our logic. Like how do, I'm new, as you know, to the system here as well. And so how do we, are we, are we watching those other movements about how other abolishments of and also the potential burgeoning and the support of other ideas like you said ai how are we thinking about the intersection of other type of uh key uh, academic and future so we don't see these issues that we see at wvu for example and i know this it's more complicated than just seeing a world language and a literature uh, unit being abolished Sure, sure, absolutely. And um, you said intersections. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot. We've been lucky to come through two eras, apart from Taylor Swift, uh, of great investment and, uh, you know, in growth. And we've watched that, which brings all of you to us. It has brought just a richness on this campus that now we want to look about how we bring those things together for our students. Uh, where can world languages at WVU, where could they have been part of an intersection that would have been a new horizon for students? Where could they have been part of a conversation? What could they have done with a public administration, another place? Place very close to my heart that was decimated there. And so I think we are trying to think about those connections, those intersections where people live, where our, our students will learn for the future and looking to those as places that we can grow in and be involved in. So I think that is something that uh, it, it's very important to understand in the way that we think about it. And, you know, as uh, our president said, you know, those new horizons, we need to be thinking about what will be the jobs and how we bring all of what we do well and our strengths here together to put that forward in our students. And, and we have to do that in a context. You know, and th this is about the transparency and context and, and that sort of thing. So we can all think together um, and that, you know, when we are problem solvers together, we'll get to better solutions. And what do I, I mean by um, context? Um, and as Vicki said, we will be transparent. Retention and graduation are essential at this university. Filling the funnel, uh, what happened to WVU, you know, as everyone knows, the demographic cliff, um, you know, and so focusing on those things together and you all knowing uh, that accountability and responsibility in terms of how you prevent certain things from happening. And that's where, you know, uh, transparency and uh, a former OMB director uh, <laughs> You know, you focus on the budgets, you get ahead, you understand the levers and that sort of thing. And so I'll use it as an opportunity to mention the importance of retention and the importance of attracting our um, students, both graduate and undergraduate. You all are essential to that. I meet with the students and I can tell you that caring relationship with one of you is like a keeper. It's sticky. It's stickiness. Um, it is about them feeling they belong and they belong as a piece of community and they belong in terms of uh, you you set off an intellectual journey for them. You care about uh, what's happening in their lives. You help them with their interest. All of those things are an important part of how we build an institution um, that can work in today's constraints and think through things like this intersectionality. And the intersectionality, interestingly, brings me back to Saeed. Uh, in terms of, of that, because this place in 1957 was interdisciplinary. Like, think about that. In 1957, before many of you, most in this room, were born, it was already thinking about um, 
interdisciplinary work intersectionality. You hear that peace conflict resolution. We've had people here at the School of International Service in the environment and health for years. And so this intersectionality that Vicki's talking about is something we know about. Do we have uh, do we have to work on how to do it better, bureaucratic things, those kinds of things, but it is something we inherently know and do. The School of International Service together with the College of Arts and Sciences were the inter original host before became university-wide of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. Think about how we think about this interdisciplinary work. We think it's important to scholarship and research, and we think it's very important to our students. Thank you, Rodney. Please. Yeah. Just what I, you heard all three of us mention in our separate remarks how strong our community is and how important it is. So it really is important to us. And you all are joining this community here of scholars here that we're going to lean on. Um, Vicki mentioned our faculty senate. We truly believe in shared governance. We want you to get involved. We want you to reach out to us. I mean, you're meeting your, your president provost on the first day. And so you're going to have access to them. So we want you, if there are issues that you actually bring it to them. Um, you mentioned that issue with AI. We, we're already from, at the Ann Farron conference, which will happen in January. We're going to have, uh, I shouldn't be able to just yet, I haven't talked to Vicki yet, but we are planning on having a, a plenary speaker talk about that. But there are many issues that come to the forefront on this campus that we are going to actually reach out to you all to help us with the guidance on those. So, so definitely please get involved with our campus. Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Gilchrist. I'm a new librarian and I'm working with SIS and SPA um, graduate students. And you all mentioned how important community is and a lot of the things that you've been talking about are part of the research that I've been conducting. So if we have things that we would like to connect with you, what is the best way for us to reach out to you? Like, how do you want us to connect with you? Just email. You have us. You have the <laughs> president at American at EU, provost at American at EU, and dean of faculty at American at EU. Just, just email us. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. CTRL at American at EU. Yeah. 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 I actually have a question that was pre submitted as part of the registration form, and I think this one goes to Monica. Uh, are there resources for first year faculty to connect with faculty in other departments? Yes, there'll be quite a few. So for one, you are going to have a luncheon with myself and Vicki um, twice in the semester. So we'll help you with that. We also are working with your deans um, to form some more um, bonding. We're gonna have a, an, another faculty social that you're gonna hear about later on. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you're, if you're looking for research collaborators, I can help you with that. You reach out to me or to Diana Burley, which you'll meet later on today in a session. And so again, so that again, all comes back to that idea a community building that we truly believe in. So we're going to help foster that for you. And if you wanted to, um, I find I have breakfast with faculty once a month um, uh, from all the schools. Uh, so if you want to do it, let your dean know. Um, generally, or associate who the, the deans will collect that information. The deans will collect that information because that's another place where I tend to find that faculty um, meet each other that don't know each other because it's people from different schools and we can often make um, great connections in terms of seeing how the work um, can do it. So there are a number of different places. The other thing I would just suggest is when you're participating in some of the other community-wide activities, that's where I find uh, the water cooler nature uh, of um, you know sharing and that sort of thing in terms of faculty making those connections. Other questions from the room? Here we go. Hi, I'm uh, Julie Anderson, and I'm also a non-traditional uh, academic. I've uh, spent my entire career in practice in finance and international business. So I was just wondering, and, and I love disruption, especially when it comes to finance and business. Um, can you speak at all about um, the fact that we do attract such a global student body population? Some of those statistics, how important is it? Are you, you know, what are you watching? And also placement of those students, because I do think, you know, American University sending its future leaders out into the globe is something that that's important to me. And I'd love to hear how you're thinking about it. 
Absolutely. And yes to everything you said. So AU has always prided itself on this great international student body. At one time we had, what, six leaders of the world were AU grads or was it seven? It was six or seven at one period, in one moment. Yeah, and so we really do take pride in educating students here and sending them out to do great work. We've seen a decline. I think 9-11 was the first start, the first hit to the system of, uh, you know, our student, international student body. And we kind of started recovering from that. And we know that COVID in and, in and of itself, but also the policies that followed COVID have been really detrimental to our work in bringing international students here. And it's something that we're regaining the muscle. We're looking to new ways to recruit them. We're looking to partnerships that we're forming around the world and all the time paying attention to how we can maintain that as a point of pride for us. So we really are intentional about how we build it back. Uh, and then making sure, and we just had this conversation in an enrollment meeting on Friday, because we do that on Fridays, we meet about enrollment and retention, but we talked about how we might have to take extra steps and what can we think about in our policies? What can we review? How can we look at, you know, the questions we ask about financial resources and those things to help that? And frankly, what, how can we work with the State Department to in any way assist those students trying to get the paperwork they need to join us and to be part of our community? We miss them and, you know, are looking for that ways to build back there, but it is still a priority at AU. Um, Vicki, I think covered um, everything in terms of, you know, there are strategic things and tactical things that we're pursuing because the numbers have on the undergraduate side, actually COGOG, where is where I assume you are, um, our business school, um, actually this year has seen a bump, uh, an increase, but we have to see, but the visas, um, so the visas are uh, a problem that we're having. So there are different kinds of issues that we face, sort of external issues uh, and internal issues that we need to do. Vicki was referencing, I had met two students, you know, our international students had arrived, some of our graduate students had arrived last week and I walked the campus, um, I walked to work every day. So um, I met two of our students from West Africa. And one of the things that, you know, because I met these students from West Africa, I asked, you know, so how's it going? What do you know? And they were working on housing. And so how we think about helping our foreign students, especially those graduate students who uh, having studied, having been a graduate student, you know, having studied abroad three different times, um, like, boy, oh boy, I know what it's like when you arrive and you're trying to figure it out. Um, everything, you know, from like, wait, I got to have this kind of bank account to do, you know, all that stuff. And so how we're thinking about some of that um, for those students. And then we have to think about filling the funnel in terms of how we attract them. So this is something very focused on in enrollment, both graduate and undergraduate, uh, and both addressing the contextual points. I mean, we went so far as we will be in touch with the State Department because the visa thing is just, and 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 this is one we can partner with other institutions. Like at one point it had gotten so bad that Larry Bacow at Harvard and I were like, okay, we're going to go visit the State Department and see, you know, make some suggestions for them. Because during COVID, everything was fro completely no visas, you know, uh, in terms of that time. So an important thing that we're continuing to work on, a priority, as you can hear in terms of focused on it right now. But as you all, you know, what you all bring and your thoughts are, you know, welcome to us. All right, so we're almost at time. Maybe we have time for one more question. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tops Fischel. I'm the School of Education. I had a quick question. Um, so AU is, I'm hearing about all these wonderful things that AU is doing. And I'm wondering is like, is is communication to the outer world basically bragging? Is that a part of the fuel going forward? Because I know many other schools, they, I mean, if somebody drops a pin, you know, it's on CNN. Oh my gosh, somebody dropped a pin. And I'm just wondering about the extent to which, you know, greater, I'm not going to say better, but greater communication to the outside world is a part of the fuel. Because as we know, that's going to attract funders. So uh, I will quote uh, the former provost. We don't have a ton of swagger here, or we haven't in the past. It's not been a place that 
Uh, and you can see this when you talk to the people who are here in leadership. You know, they thought bra being bragging was maybe not the way to go. That changed. I'll never remember, forget the first time I met Sylvia at a reception. She's like, I've lived in DC. I didn't know enough about AU. And that, that is something that over the last uh, six, seven years has really changed. And so you will see us out there trying to, you know, make sure we have people in the press out there making, you know, on Capitol Hill and, the, you know, in all the places where you can have input and you want to be with your research. That's what we want to support and our communication function, both in the schools and across the university. And I will tell you this, this university has enormous power in translation. And it's something that we are looking to lean into over the next few years and really make sure that people have the opportunity. I know for faculty, some of you are like, oh, that's not me, blah, blah, blah. We just need to lower the cost for you so that you can do it and be part of that and do it in a way that you care about and want to have your work out there. And then we need to run with it because we have so much to brag about and so much good work going on. But we have been a little humble in the past. And um, yeah, we need to shake that off and uh, brag a bit more. Um, and I would put it, uh, and I am the chief um, chief pride officer, I would consider myself um, for this university. Um, and, and then actually, that is one of the things, not being an alum, that actually is much easier, right? Uh, in terms of like, that's makes my job in doing this much easier. But I just think we, um, as an institution have so much to be proud about and for, um, and we need your help. Like, let me know when you publish, um, make sure I know when you publish, because I like to brag, uh, or show pride, uh, when you publish in terms of promoting and that sort of thing everywhere, um, I go. And it is that people don't know. I, I can't remember where I was. Oh, I was with a group of presidents. I was with our Patriot League presidents on Friday. And one of them was like, gosh, congratulations, Sylvia. Second year in a row, American Universities Unite Model UN team, top in all of North America. Second year in a row, rare do you ever have that. Um, at our School of Education, um, our... Uh, no, actually at the COBOT, we have uh, a professor. And this is why you're going to hear when I told you more announcements and stuff is because we are going to be celebrating these things and making sure that people know more and more. And I hope you're going to get to know um, your fellow faculty and the students. There is so much. We have eight Pulitzer Prize winning students on this campus. OK, so they were part of the Washington Post, that program that I mentioned that Lowry is now taking over is a program of journalists that our students work with the Washington Post. They are listed in the Pulitzer Prize that the Post won for their January 6th investigation work. Those are our students. If you all go um, last week at the um, look in the Washington Post, there's a Smithsonian speak piece. It's about the Smithsonian. It's quite disturbing. It's collections of brains and body parts. Six of our students helped with that piece. Um, our faculty, Rachel Schneider, um, Rachel is, um, Rachel's book, which is on domestic violence, not a topic that you think people want to read about. Her nonfiction piece of work that she produced, our faculty member, top 10 book of the New York Times for the year. Nonfiction, domestic violence. That's the kind of work, that's the kind of impact that is happening at this place. And I'm actually going to write the blurb for the first textbook uh, in the United States on um, first ladies uh, in terms of the role of first lady in history. Anita Brooke Bride here at American University publishing that book. Uh, Jill Biden's got the foreword and uh, you know, first. It's just thing after thing after thing, to your point. I could go on all day, I won't, because I think we're at the end. But you can see your point is well taken. We got to, we, everybody, I'm trying to arm you. So you're going to be ready uh, to go out there and be part of the pride of being a part of this great institution. So, and that's actually what we, so you'll know, that was a big part of my announcement. When you look at my announcement about my this being my last year, there is a reason you know, it is structured as it is, because it is about people knowing and understanding. It was a point where people were going to be looking and observing, and we want to make sure people know who we are and what we do and what we contribute uh, in terms of this community. 
I think a great, and I'll turn it back. Thank you so much, all three of you for coming and joining.